What's going on, everybody? This is your man, Chuck Creekmer, a.k.a. Jigsaw for AllHipHop.com. We are here with an icon, a legend, a Grammy Award-winning MC, young MC, one of our favorites. Like, <laughs> it's been, yeah, man. I mean, it's yeah. been a long time, man. So, so I, 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 well, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead, dude. You, yeah, it's been a long time. So you know, you're yeah. you're, you're you're the interviewer. So go ahead, man. I, you yeah, know, nah, it's, I'm it's, not gonna assume. I, I'm not gonna assume to know what you wanna what you wanna talk about. So so go ahead and go well, ahead do your thing, man. Hey, man, I got a lot of questions. I I want to talk about everything. I'm like, uh, man, I hope I hope this doesn't go forever because I got right. a lot. I got a lot of questions. But one thing I'll say is, you know, I've been, um, you know, I I went out. I went to reach out to you and I said, oh, wow, I've, I've already reached out before uh, on, right. uh, on Twitter. So right. it was glad I was glad to get a response finally um, from right. you after that second inquiry and um, wanted, first of all, to just kind of get a gauge on what you were up to. You know, I don't readily see you, uh, you know, on social media or in the headlines. I, I well, that's that's partially by design. You mm. know, what I mean, I'm a I'm a. OG when it comes to that, I'm a brick and mortar guy. Right. Like if I'm making music, I'm, you know, pushing and, and you know, looking to promote and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. especially with the music, literally, I mean, my first album, I had LPs, cassettes and CDs on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So so I, I go from there to, you know, downloading and then and then uh, um, iTunes and the like and then mm -hmm. streaming and now, you know, streaming services and and it's, it's become less and less and less in terms of the actual product, yeah. but it's become more and more and more in terms of the invasiveness of people in the artist's lives, in my mm -hmm. opinion. So yeah. I, I, I purposely, if there's something I got to do, like promote a show or, you know, something I'm obligated to do, I'll jump into social media. But most of the time, just on a daily, I wasn't really with it because I didn't really see as much of a benefit of it. I was on tour and most of the people in the crowd you know, were of a demographic that weren't really looking for me on social media. Mm -hmm. They they were look they 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 they're like, okay, he's in town. You work with radio, whatever. So the importance it's gotten more important as as you know the last few years have have, have gone on, and also it's become more involved in terms of even someone in my my age bracket or my demographic in terms of of how important it is for me to promote. So. Yeah. You know, I, I've 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 had all those th things in mind, and I, I'm sorry I didn't respond the first time. I get bombarded with a lot of stuff. I get I yeah. I, I got to tell you, man. So, like I said, it's I'm good sure. to be doing this with you now. No yeah. doubt. Now, first of all, I I was looking at the comments after you performed uh, at the uh, NBA Finals last night, Game One, and yes, uh, I was looking at the comments, and one of them remarked about your name, like, "Wow, you know, Young MC, he's yeah. not young anymore." And right? yeah, and I was like, I, I, I didn't think uh, bad of it. I think it's just a common no. thing. Yeah. Right. What, 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 what is, you know, sort of going back to the name when you first got that name, you know, or gave yourself that name, I should say, yeah, what, right. were, what was on your mind? And did you ever think you would still have a career in hip hop this many years later? No, no. You, you know, when you're 20 and you're making records, you're like, okay, when I'm 50, I'm going to be doing something different. But um, it's just kind of worked out to the point where I'm still doing it and making it happen and the like. Um, my last name is Young, and I was always the youngest one in the party or the youngest one in the crew. I was, I started like 12 years old, and I was in there, you know, battling or, or rhyming with with guys 16, 17, 18. So I've always kind of punched above my weight when it when it came when it came to that. And uh, yeah, I did call myself Young MC. I'm pretty much the first one to use Young in the name spelled correctly <laughs> till you know and um and i and i've just kept it so yeah. i would never i would never change my name i would never you know this is what i do this is who i am and any new music i make or any new things i do i want to be a continuation of the legacy i started with you know yeah. with my name from before of course of course now mm -hmm. uh for me one of the biggest things that i didn't know when you first came out was that you were from New York, Queens yeah. specifically. Mm -hmm. um, yes, sir. Everybody that I know and everybody on this side, I mean, pretty much everybody, I think, assumed you were from the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak on that in general, also sort of the duality of your existence at that time? Well, um, I learned how to rhyme on the East Coast. 
And for the most part, I do not have an, an East Coast accent, don't have a New York accent. Mm -hmm. So when people heard me and heard me on records and heard the way that I was rhyming in my speech pattern, they just assumed that I definitely was not from the East Coast. I didn't, I don't think I had a West Coast. I probably have a generic, almost Midwest kind of accent, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, the, as I've grown older, I realized you being in New York, man, look, New York hip hop was very territorial. When I was a kid, you could literally look on a subway map and the entire hip hop world as I knew it was on that subway map. Mm -hmm. You know, did this, did, you know, the public enemies from Long Island and, and EPMDs from here and, and Run DMC from Queens. And you know what I mean? So everybody, you know, bo Boogie Down for Productions from the Bronx, whatever, everybody was locking into the fact that, that all the hip hop that they knew coming up was in New York. Mm -hmm. And as, I, as, as hip hop co started coming from other places, uh, different sounds, New York was really holding on to it, at least from my standpoint. So I reached the realization that if I had stayed in New York, being the youngest kid, and New York just kind of be in line. So all mm -hmm. the all the all the guys from the from the early early to mid '80s, you know, from the, really the beginnings of hip hop, they were all in line in front of me. So me trying to sign a record deal in '87 and put out a record in '89, I wouldn't have been able to make a busted move. I wouldn't have been able to ride a wild thing. I wouldn't. It just that music like that was not made there. Yeah. Whereas coming coming to the West Coast. Not only were they happy that someone that 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 had my kind of rhyming skills was claiming the West Coast because I came out there and I'm like these people are embracing me. I'm not gonna say oh East Coast East Coast wave the mm -hmm. flag while I'm while while I'm collecting checks from them. I'm like no, mm -hmm. I'm out here, you know. I'm at, I'm at Skateland. I'm at World on Wheels. I'm at the Casa. I'm on K Day. I'm doing all the things that West Coast artists do. I'm not gonna do all that and then say yo I'm East Coast. I mean, it was great to it was great to hear myself played on Red Alert. I will not lie. When mm -hmm. I heard Let Them Know get played on Red Alert, and I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking Chuck Chill out play me, but whatever. But but the first time I heard Red Alert, Red Alert play me, I felt that that was a you know yeah. that 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 was that was a um a, a landmark that I reached that yeah. I you know that I've been looking forward to. But then to see the infancy of hip hop on the West Coast, dude, mm -hmm. and you're talking Ice T, Toddy T, end up N W A, um you know, all, all these dudes and to see their love, not only their love for hip hop, but just the different approach, how musical it was. So they were listening to, you know, Gap Band and Fat Back and Parliament and, mm -hmm. and all these things. And we were going over breakbeats on the East Coast, but it was so much more musical, you yeah. know, on the West Coast, because they weren't just cutting up two good times or they weren't just cutting up to Walk This Ways or mm -hmm to you know daisy ladies or whatever it like it wasn't just the ultimate breaks and beats they were going beyond it yeah. and to and to see that experience that but then for me i never i was never one of those mcs to say okay i gotta rhyme over a certain beat if it's right. got too much music in it if it's too fast i mean obviously if, you know you're gonna throw me something you know 150 beats a minute whatever yeah. but i'm saying it and you know in general if it was something people grew to i could rhyme over it so yeah. that gave me the flexibility like know how, for example, I wrote know how at, at 112 beats a minute mm -hmm. to a, to a track that I made, and then the Dust Brothers came and they had the Shaft beat, and that was about 118 and, and felt like 120. So I'm I'm saying rhymes way faster than I normally would. Like if they had given me that beat originally, I wouldn't have written those lyrics. Right. But it, it turned into a really great record because I was really struggling to make that happen. I went I went almost 20 years without performing that record, and mm -hmm. then when I went back to uh. I think I was going overseas. I think it was Australia. Okay. I rehearsed it a bit to to do there, and um, and and then put it in the show, and 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 found that, you know, Europe, Europe, Australia, even certain DJs or whatever. That's a bigger record. No how's a bigger record than Bust a Move. So I'm like, okay, I got to keep this in. So those those things, you know, just kind of getting that flexibility, realizing there's a, there's different listeners to different styles in different places, and then I'm able to appeal to a lot of those people in different places. That that's that's kind of got my focus going in terms of uh, in terms of saying, okay, this is you know this is what kind of makes me a worldwide artist, you know, long term. Yeah, definitely. I was doing a little re reading up and research, and I saw that Principal's office was big in uh australia like a number yeah, one yeah. hit yeah yeah, and, and it, yeah no it's no it was a big record and and i just did a tour there and i i don't perform that record anymore i just yeah. don't I was, yeah. I was old i was old for that record when i made that record talking about yeah. you know um middle school or high school and i was i was a college graduate when that record came out right, you know what I mean? right. so 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 for me it, it's what it's a psychological thing but it, 
principal's office is the kind of record if I'm there as a 40 year old or 30, you know, 30 to 40 year old and beyond, if I'm performing that record every night, it's going to really feel like work. It's really yeah. going to feel like, man, this is, I'm stuck in this. Bust yeah. the Move is a, Bust the Move is a record. Okay. You know what I mean? It's a dance record and, and, and it, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Principal's office is a really specific time, re really specific mm -hmm. place. And from an artistic level, it just was difficult for me to say, okay, I'm going to keep performing it. So I literally stopped performing in the early 90s. I may, I may start up again, um, mm -hmm. we had, you know, in, in, in some way, shape or form. But for, but for now, I'm, you know, it's just something that I, that I don't do and I just kind of move on. Yeah, yeah. Now you you spoke on that being old when that song came out, you yeah. know, older I should say. Yeah, yeah. But but um, talk about Stone Cold Rhyming. Like a lot of the lyrics on the album were written well, way before, way before. Yeah. It, 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 all right, I'll give you a little insider tip. When I, you know, a lot of those rhymes that went on Stone Cold Rhyming, I was not a songwriter when I wrote those rhymes. So it's okay. like, okay, here's a beat. It's you know, ninety seven. It's a hundred. It's ninety two. Whatever it is. I'm going to take a 16 here for the first, a 16 for the second, and a 16 for the third. Within, you know, within reason. Sometimes it will be a 16 that I had for the first verse, and then I'd kind of write the second and third. But it would generally be I finish my 16 and then say the hook. Right. My name is Young. See, I, you know, I let them know. My name is Young. Got right. more rhymes. You know, I got know-how, you know, kind of thing. Even though know-how I kind of wrote during the time, but it wasn't a thing where I let into a hook that right. had lyrics in it. I hope right. that I was doing lyrics. It was more like, I can spit. Let me show 16 that I can spit. Mm -hmm. And let me give you eight bars to recover from that. Mm -hmm. And I did that for, I did that for like, I probably half the record, you know, mm -hmm. on, on, and even, and even bust the move, but bust the move. I wrote bust the move. I, I, you know, I wrote obviously to the track with that, with that theme in mind and mm -hmm. had the girl singing, but every, you know, I just remember Stone Cold Rhyming is like, okay, I got a book of rhymes. I got a bunch of mm -hmm. tracks. Lay the 16s down, say the hook, we got songs. Right, and right. only afterwards did I, did I realize, oh, it would be great if I incorporated the hook in the verse. So if I, you know, if I, if I, it's almost like when you have disjointed verses like that, the verses don't sound like you know where they're going. Right. Like, I just have a bunch of songs yeah. talk about how good you are. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and you're saying, and you're saying hooks. Hey, I'm not going to hate on it. It's, it, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the, my most popular record and, and changed my life in a whole bit. But I knew as a songwriter, I could grow from that. So, right. so that, that's, a, that's the thing about Stone Cold Rhyming that really sticks out to me is like hearing that, hearing the success I was to ha able to have with that and knowing the growth that I still had to go with, you know, that was a nice eye opener for me. Yeah, yeah. Now you are, you emerge in the very beginnings of the golden era of hip hop. So we're talking the late, late eighties. Stone Cold Rhyming comes out in 89. Right. Right. Um, go ahead. No. All right. Just pause button right there. Cause I mm -hmm. have a thing about the golden era. Okay. I think the golden era, I think the golden era that, that, that someone says, okay, a time period is a golden era depends on what genre of hip hop or what area of hip hop they're talking about. Okay. Somebody, somebody from the East coast is going to describe a golden era that goes back into the late eighties, maybe even mid eighties, because mm -hmm. that was, that, that, that was the strength of East coast hip hop then. A West Coast hip hop artist is a West Coast person and in, 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 a person influenced by West Coast hip hop is going to have a golden era that's a little bit later. Mm -hmm. That's going to peak with Dre and Snoop, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and 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 Cube and 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 then NWA to a certain extent. But the point being is that the golden era for someone someone looking at West Coast is going to be later. A gold the golden era for someone from the South is even going to be later later than that. You talk to somebody in Atlanta influenced by. T.I. and Ludacris and all that, their golden era is not going to start as early as a New York yeah. person's golden right. era. Right. So right. you talking about the golden era where it is is because you were influenced by East, East Coast hip hop. Yeah. But, it, but it's interesting to me, the golden era seems to be like a, a floatable thing depending on where, where the strength of your, of, of your hip hop influence was. Well, you know, I also look at it from this point of view. You know, I, I specifically drilled down on the year 88. And okay. that's the reason I say 88 is because NWA dropped, Public Enemy dropped, yes. Ghetto Boys dropped. Right. Um, you know, uh, two There was short, a lot of records. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of formative records, the kind of foundation of what would eventually be those other periods, I think, for the most part, came out in 80, 88 specifically. Well, 88 is an interesting year because in terms of like Ghetto Boys started, you know, you could say started that region. Mm -hmm. Um 
NWA, obviously, and also Tone's record dropped. Yeah, like Wild yeah. Thing dropped in '88. Exactly. So mm -hmm. and and to see and that record sold four million when yeah. record when rap records weren't yeah. selling that. They yeah. on Wild Thing, they literally stopped pressing singles. It's right. like, oh, maybe we should start selling albums now. You know what I mean? So <laughs> so it literally outsold We Are the World as a single. Wow. That's Think crazy. about that, dude, That's as crazy. a rap record. That's so crazy. 88, and 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 to your point, the thing about 88 is that 88 kind of took the took the beating in terms of, of all the all the things that people would say about rap music. I know when I won my Grammy, it came down the next day. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I, I came down the next day, I'm wearing a suit, uh -huh. and this 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 woman, um, a woman of Indian descent with a British accent. I'm supposed to do interviews and she says, oh, I'm surprised you don't have the Grammy around your neck on a chain. Wow. Like that, yeah. that was the assumption. That's not yeah. me, that's not me, but that was the assumption about rap. Yeah. But that's coming from what she saw in 88 and before. Right. Once, once 89 passed, it was a different music then, dude. Like mm -hmm. we, had, like I know me, I, I hold the flag for me and Tone and the West Coast for what we did in terms of making it nationwide, but the East Coast was changing around and, and you had the South coming into the game where it became a, not only a national music, but the, the, the sounds were so different. You could mm -hmm. name, just the artists you named, the, 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 genres, the, the genres were so wild, wide. I mean, if you turn on, you turn on a hip hop station, you turn on a, a hip hop streaming station, a lot of the stuff, if, you, if, the, if it's trap, it's trap. Yeah. Whereas in 88, if you said it was a hip hop record and you go from Poor Righteous Teachers yeah. to Ghetto Boys yeah. to, mm -hmm. you know, to N.W.A., I mean, that's, I mean, to, to whomever else you want to name. And, and on top of the Run DMC records and, and all that, you know, that was yeah. still going. That's a really wide range of hip hop. So yeah. that that year, it's interesting because I have, I have a thought process that 89 was a special year in terms of rap's acceptance. Uh -huh. And that, that I think is because 88 was a year that rap showed its variety. That, right. that you yeah. know, like yeah. people, you know, before the Ghetto Boys, people didn't know that you could have a national act coming out of Texas like that. Yeah. I mean, and and wasn't now, now now you would know better, but didn't wasn't two live crew kind of yeah you know what yeah, I mean definitely. so so literally mm -hmm. you can you can pick most regions mm -hmm. and say that eighty eight was a seminal year in terms of the establishment of regions other than the East Coast, but the East Coast mm -hmm. was was changing at mm -hmm. that point too, and this yeah. is before cell phone, before internet. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's what makes that time period to me so special. Yeah, because. You know, you had people all over the country listening to different stuff, not being, mm -hmm. not having a connectivity of right now. Yeah. So that's when people go back and listen to music like that, and they're like, "Man, I didn't really hear this that much." Yeah. You know, yeah. I have a, I have a, I have a DJ friend, um, I have a DJ friend in Atlanta who was telling me some some hot records that were playing then, and he was playing some East Coast records, and and I had gone to uh, going to LA in '85, so I wasn't as familiar with some of the regional stuff. Okay. And he was he was even even now he's he throw some stuff in like I vaguely remember a hook or thought it was a bit catchy, but those were huge records regionally. Right. This massive record. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the thing about a New York hip hop fan, you don't know about no regional record. New York was the mm -hmm. region. New York was it. If yeah. it was out, it you know, that's a hip hop record. It ain't no region where everybody right. else had to be concerned about region. You know what right, I mean? So, right, yeah. so yeah, yeah. That yeah, I yeah. think eighty eight was the year that regions really got established. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mention that because I was blessed enough to have parents from Virginia. Right. So when I so w whenever I would go to Virginia, I would just hear completely different stuff. So that's why when Sir Mix a Lot was just first starting, I would know Square Dance rap and all these crazy yeah, yeah, obscure yeah, yeah. records that nobody where I'm from would would have heard because they were mostly in that in, in the Delaware region, which is not really that close to New York. Made right. made us very acceptable. Uh, accepting of of every region, you know. So we listened to Too Short, right, and 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 N.W.A. and right, also right. Luke, you know, before you know before you know before the uh, raunchiness even, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So so we so we were listening to just about everything, and that's why even to this day, me and MC Hammer are, are really cool because I didn't see anything wrong with what he was doing at the time you know no. a lot a lot of people were critical of him well th this this is what i found because i i would always get the you know i always get the moniker of you know oh you you crossed over you went pop sell out this blah 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 <laughs> right and and i take it i'm like okay i'm a crossover rapper and you know i have a lot of you know fans well i, I have a lot of fans on the pop side but the interesting thing what's a statistic that i that i love to to quote is that during the height of public enemy 90 percent of their of their record buying fans were non-black right 
You know what I mean? So yeah. it it didn't really matter what type of music it was being consumed. You know, mm -hmm. world, you know, worldwide anyhow. So that you know, something like that, you look at and you say, okay, you know, this this music is definitely appealing to a lot of people, and it's the kind of thing where you you may not have everybody going to shows or everybody you know raising their hand saying I'm a fan, but yeah. before before the you know before the downloading before whatever when you had to buy albums. That 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 was happening in a lot of different cultures, and a lot of people found that formative years listening to rap music. Yeah, you. Um, I I definitely want to address the hate you received, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. But 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 I want to hold off on that for just a That's, minute. Yeah, it's all good. Who, you, you you know who did you who did you look up to? Who did you um, idolize? Who did you who influenced you? Man, it goes literally. I mean, I come from I came from Jamaican parents, so mm -hmm. I'm listening to you know the, the Bob Marleys and the Yellow Man. Yellow Man was a big influence right. on me as a kid. Right. Right. Um, to my dad had a crazy record collection, so like the Eagles right. and the Rolling Stones and um, and and Parliament, right. you know, to a certain extent. Uh, Casey and the Sunshine Band was a massive influence on me, and oh, to be yeah. honest, wow. yeah. Dude, just because everybody has this thing about disco, disco, disco. You know, Casey was an amazing writer. He was, mm -hmm. if you take the genre out of it, mm -hmm. those songs were fun. Those songs were, you know, were, were, were nice. Some great samples out of there mm -hmm. in terms of the sound texture. So that really influenced the stuff that I liked. And I'll give you one that, that I had a discussion with a, with a, with a, a hip hop African American older DJ. Mm -hmm. We brought this up and we started going back and forth. Martin Fry and ABC. That's mm. probably one of my biggest musical mm. influences. That How to Be a Zillionaire album, where they remixed every track on the album, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to develop my musical sensibilities, and it's right. the same time as like as like uh, John Roby and and um, Shet Pettibone and all these wow. and all these crazy cool. remixes, and I'm hearing that coming from Europe. Yeah. Dude, I am an ABC fanboy, like That's no crazy. doubt. Though, I mean, you talk about it's people say guilty pleasures. But going back and analyzing that stuff as a musician to say they did this chord change, they did that chord change, and you talk about swag. Martin mm -hmm. Fry hit the stage with swag every time, tight mm -hmm. suit, the whole bit. Right. If he was a, if he was a black artist, they make more of a big like he would be like Morris Day. He would be right, like a right. like a like a white they, like they they make a, a much more big, big deal about his about his style. But yeah. he just he just hit the stage and and just did it. And some of those songs I mean I mean be be near me and. How to be a millionaire and and um and look of love. Those are massive records and very influential records on me. Nice. Okay. Even, even, though, right. even, even though I never had a DJ have two of them and go, it influenced me as a DJ and as a songwriter. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, you always impressed me, even before I knew anything about you. Uh you were smart. That was that was one thing I absolutely could pull from. Um, you know. Hip hop is not always associated with being intelligent and definitely not traditionally intelligent. Um, you know, you might have street scholars or, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But I, I, I immediately could tell that you were, you were a smart guy. Um, talk about that and how it, how it, how it um, influenced your life, even your decision-making, um, even, being a young MC on a yes, college sir. campus. Well, look, I never, I never worked to say, okay, I'm gonna be the scholarly guy, and I'm, I'm gonna, you know, walk around with books, and even I wore the glasses to the Grammys. Was just, a, I don't need glasses, or didn't need glasses at the time. It was just a look thing. I just didn't want to dumb myself down to make my music. I didn't feel it necessary. I felt, I felt it was stereotypical, and it wasn't something that was coming from the artists. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like I've never been. I've never rapped in front of somebody and I'm saying, man, you, you speak too well. You know what I mean? Right. Or, or whatever. If the, if the flow's good, the flow's good. If the cadence is good, the cadence is good. The only time you get into all, all of that, you know, um, um, intelligence or lack of intelligence stuff really has to do with how an artist is portrayed or how a hip hop artist or a rapper is portrayed, which once again, we'll go back to that, that interviewer at post Grammy saying that they wanted to see the, 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 the award around my neck on the chain. It's like, I can wear a suit. I can I can sit in me. I had a degree, so I'm there with just as much education as, as the next person that that I was dealing with in terms of a meeting. But a lot of people, in terms of compartmentalizing hip hop, if they say, okay, these are not smart guys, street guys, thug guys, 
guys that don't have a background anywhere near mine. So let's just let's just question their intelligence for the whole genre. And I was just not going to go for that, dude. Yeah. So even if I took slings from my own people on my own side, I'm like, I'm going to represent this level of intelligence. And for me, you know, it wasn't something I was trying to put on any kind of act. I'm just going to speak like Marvin speaks with the vocabulary that Marvin has. If Marvin pulls out a five or six syllable word, hey, you may have to look it up, but I can do that and I can rhyme too. Yeah. And that's always been something I've been proud of. And, um, and and looking back on it, I think it was something that really benefited me because I had a lot of people listening to me where I was, the, that was basically where they dipped their toe into rap music. They're like, yeah. wait, he, he, he has a background like mine or mm -hmm. talks like I talk or went to school like I did. The, the funny thing for me is that I've always tried to, to, to be myself and stay away from that. And I've let my, my skills do my talking. So you hear a lot of people talk about, at least you know, back in the day when they talk about um, the criticism of me and selling out, and whatever. You never hear anybody talk about I, the fact that I can't rhyme, because yeah. that was always my thing. Is that my skills? My, my skills is what I what I what I what I hang my flag on. Is is yeah. I know I can spit with the best of them, and it's always been that. So yeah. Now now I've read you. <clears throat> I've read the story and heard the story about uh, being sort of discovered. On the at USC University yes, of Southern California, um, but I, I didn't. I never quite understood. Did you? You know, were you planning to go out there to rhyme? Did no. or did? Okay, so you were no, no. in school. T tell in tell school. us about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've been. I've been rhyming. I've been rhyming since about seventy eight. Okay. And that that would have made me eleven, probably okay. 10, 10, 10, eleven years old. And went right through through college. So I start college in '85, mm -hmm. go out to USC, and after sophomore year, so this would have been the summer of '87, I go back to New York. And if you remember Rock and Soul Records on 35th, mm -hmm. you know if you know that record store. Anyway, yeah. that was the record store for a bunch of reasons that DJs went to. But the main thing was that they they were they were a uh, a wholesale distributor. So their retail their retail prices were cheaper than a Florida record store's wholesale prices. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. So I would go down to Florida, a dude would be selling a, a, a you know a, a 12 inch single for like eight dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, what do you pay for that? And he's like, oh I pay I pay five ninety nine so, you know or you know I pay five fifty and I'm like well I can get that I can I, I can get that same thing you know for for four fifty at mm -hmm. rock and soul. Right. So it's only the shipping that I'd be paying for him to get cheaper. So anyway I bought I bought a whole bunch of you know all my records from there to the point when when Def Jam was out, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 the first uh, Beastie Boys and 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 Cool J and and the like, um, I remember going to a dude that worked in there and said, "I want everything on Def Jam. Right. I just want I, if it has a Def Jam label, I just want it. Yeah. You know, even and there, there was some there was some early stuff that wasn't the strongest on Def Jam, but I just wanted yeah. it because it was Def Jam. Yeah. So long story short, there was a dude named Eric that worked at Rock and Soul. I told him I rapped. I came home from from college after after sophomore year in '87. We were, we uh, cut some demos. We we're supposed to get with a record company called Get Busy Records. I think was the name of it. Mm -hmm. That never came to pass. But he sent the stuff to Delicious Vinyl to okay. the guys in L.A. So I go August of '87. I get back to my dorm room. Those guys hear some stuff. They call me up, and they say, "Do some rhymes." And I do, you know, do some rhymes over the phone. And it was Matt Matt Dyke and Michael mm -hmm. Ross. Mm -hmm. And I do three or four verses, which ended up being "Let Them Know" and "My Name Is Young." or part of it and maybe even got more rhymes but i did several verses for them and within a week they sent me a contract okay so i'm I, at that point i'm in student senate at usc so i literally mm -hmm. you know and you the way it is you represent certain certain uh, uh different constituencies so, yeah. so one would represent the apartments one would represent yeah. dorms you know whatever so i literally go to the law school representative of student wow. senate with the contract and say yo could you look at this for me <laughs> wow that's and crazy he looked it over um, I ended up signing it, obviously, and mm -hmm. then you know the, the, the rest kind of moved on like that. I, I had written for Tone. I, I, I had written for myself. Principal's Office is going to be my single. Yeah. And then and then Wild Thing came out and blew up. Yeah. And then they they put you know and I had helped write that. Um, what F F Funky Cole Medina blew up, and then they're like, okay, Marvin, you should come out with a dance record. So mm -hmm. they came with that track, mm -hmm. and I literally like. Wild thing I had done in about 35 minutes, and it took about three verses of that. Mm -hmm. Funky Cole Medina, I did it in an hour, and it took like two verses of that. Mm -hmm. Bust the move. The only difference is that I called it Make That Move because we didn't have a title at the time. 
So I said, okay, make that move with everything else. Mm -hmm. Hour and a half. They said, why don't you change the title to Buster Move? Like Funky Comedina, they had made up like they wanted it to be Love Potion Number no. Nine, like it was a drink. So right. they were coming up with like creative titles, the guys at the label. So they said, okay, let's call it Buster Move. Hour and a half, change of title, and that changed my life. Right. Like it's just, it's literally just that yeah. simple. Now right. to put to put you in my mind frame because I want to I want to give you some stuff that I haven't told people. Okay. To put you in my mind frame where I was, Tone comes out with Wild Thing. It's like 126, 128, something like that. Rock record. Heavy, mm -hmm. heavy, you know, heavy bass, guitar hits, all that stuff. He's at that speed with his cadence. Yeah. Then Funky Comedina, a little bit slower, but same thing. Guitar, heavy cadence, sample, the whole mm -hmm. nine yards. I come out with Bust the Move, which is slower, has a woman mm -hmm. singing on it, right. has, a, has a more of an R&B thing. So I'm like, is it going to cross it? It may, it may be too urban or too, you know, uh, R&B or funk sound, and, you know, for it to cross over. Has a woman singing in the hook. And has uh -huh. my voice and my cadence. I sound nothing like tone. Right. So someone who's coming off a of tone low, they may not get any young MC. So yeah. I'm looking at I'm looking at Wild Thing at probably at that point two and a half million. Funky Cole Medina at a million, million and a half. And I put Bust the Move out. And right. I'm and I'm crossing my fingers. And people are mm -hmm. like, why didn't you sing Tone's records? I'm like, I made them for Tone. Right. If I right. if, if you gave me those tracks, I would have done a different cadence. But I wrote I wrote those cadences. And one one thing I will say is that even though they didn't take all the verses. The cadences came. Yeah. Even the stuff that Tone made and, and the other stuff that was made around me, those cadences came from what I started with. Yeah. So that that's that that's my love and my, you know, and my embrace of those records. And like for you know, a bunch of reasons, me and Tone are closer than ever now. And he's, mm -hmm. you know, pe they, people used to think there was, you know, beef or whatever. And even the label didn't want to tell him that I wrote the track initially, that I mm. wrote the, that I wrote the songs initially, because mm -hmm. they 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 didn't want, you know, they thought that there would be a whole um you know, uh, rivalry thing or whatever. And mm -hmm. that, you know, that's going by the wayside. But a couple of things is that I'm so appreciative to him because mm -hmm. him coming out and blowing up with those records showed me that I was able to write something that was successful for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I, that, that took away some of the insecurity that I have as an artist saying, mm -hmm. well, at least you know you can write hits. Can you right. perform hits? Right. That's number one. Right. And number two, and I'll, I'll say this, I have been asked probably a hundred times to perform Tone's records. I will mm -hmm. never, I could be mm -hmm. starving on the street which won't um, happen. But I'm saying, I could be starving on the street. I'll never perform those records. Those are Tone's records. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not a game to me. And mm -hmm. that, those records form such a big piece of his life. Mm -hmm. Those are his. Yeah. I'll yeah. take it as songwriting credit and I'll, I'll take those flowers every day. But mm -hmm. in terms of the performance of those records, he has, dude, he has parlayed that. Do you know what I mean? The, the number of records he sold at a time when people are poo-pooing hip hop. Look, I remember, I remember, and would this go back to East Coast thing? People first heard Tone, and they were saying he was trying to sound like Rakim. He wasn't <laughs> trying to sound. Right. He literally had an issue with his throat that gave him that voice. Yeah. But but, but everybody's got a pigeonhole, pigeonhole. Like yeah. put you here, put you here. So you know. So that that was a lot of stuff we went through. But I'm you know I'm so happy and proud to have him as my friend. And yeah. both of us had that journey. And I'll I'll take the year and a half that we had from the middle of 88 to the ending, end of 89. And you tell me two people that have more of an influence over hip hop in a year and a half period than me and him. In terms uh, of breaking right. something, right. in terms of yeah. literally, like yeah. it, it's come from scratch. You can't tell me what record Buster Move came from. You definitely can't tell me what record Wild Thing came from. Yeah. In terms of the, the the records that, you know, that, that oh, we created yeah. the, 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 uh, the demographic or the groundwork for the fans to listen to. It yeah. just wasn't there. You know yeah, what I mean? So, thanks. so I, I look at that, and and you know, a lot of time has passed and everything, but but I I, I look at that, and I re, I really take pride in that because I, you try and find your place, mm -hmm. and people don't usually talk of me in terms of of um, when they speak when 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 they speak of influential hip hoppers mm -hmm. at certain times, or whatever, but on the West Coast, dude, mm -hmm. I've been pulled aside by some major artists. Right. You know what right. I mean, like yo. You showed me a West Coast dude could do this. You showed me a yeah. West Coast guy could actually rap. That means so yeah. much to me, man. And yeah. and by and the fact I know there's some hate coming from the fact that I didn't stay on the East Coast. But I tell you to see your face, Chuck, straight up. If I stayed on the East Coast, you never would have heard of me. Yeah. I would have been yeah. in line, but behind everybody making the same records. I'll never yeah. forget. I was I was like 14, and I, and and I think they threw on Freedom or something at a at a at a at a backyard uh -huh. party. Yeah. And I started doing something melodic to it. And a dude yeah. pulled me and said, yo, you can't rhyme like that over that. You you right. can't, you can't, you, we, we, no, no, you gotta, you, you do, 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 do. that's how you rhyme over it. Right, right. All of us, everybody, really? Right, right. Did, dude, I don't wanna get beat up, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. okay, I I'll, I'll guess I'll rhyme like you want me to rhyme. Right, but, right. But, but you know what I mean? I go to the West Coast, it's like, okay, what you got? 
Okay, yeah. you know, here's the beat. What could you what can you do with it? Oh, let's right. try something different. Maybe the fans will get into it. Mm. That that kind of and I don't blame it was more of a culture thing in terms of New York. Like everybody mm-hmm. came up and you know, there was there was a pecking order in the crew. There was a dude named C Rock and Hollis. That was the mm. guy. He he yeah. rhymed with Davy DMX. Right. You know, right, he right. C Rock rhymed with Davy DMX and I for, I forget the name of the crew, right. but 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 like I'm I'm 11, 12, 13 years old, and these dudes are damn near grown men. What am I gonna say? You got around right. like this? Okay, I guess I got around like that. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's so, crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah that's, that's that's crazy. Now, let's, you know let's, what? If, if, by the way, Davy Davy's playing. I think is he playing bass for Public Enemy now? Something like that. If yeah. you ever get, if you ever get okay. a chance to talk to Davy DMX, I've never heard an interview of him talking about my first demo where I literally changed. I changed speeds. It was a singing record. Changed speeds from the verse. I think went from 112 in the verse to 120 in the hook, not thinking I got to go back to 112 in the verse. Right. And it taught me so many lessons, but I'm me and Dave have been cool and you know with Facebook friends and all this, but if you can ever track Davey down and ask him about me, I will okay. vouch for I will vouch for pretty much all of it. Okay, I'm gonna have to yeah, get yeah, this, this. This is this is the lethal weapon days. I walked to mm-hmm. his house from 211 to like 215. I walked mm-hmm. down Hollis Avenue, you know, okay. way before I, I barely had a bike. You know what I mean? That's crazy. Like that. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah, that's what's I saw, up. I saw, I saw you repping Queens, and you said, "I'm not, I'm not from Mount Vernon. I'm from, I'm yeah, yeah. from Queens." I was like, "Oh snap!" But, but, and, but that's the thing. That's what you did as a New York MC. Yeah, but yeah. then I come out to LA. I'm like, these are people embracing me. Why am I gonna be? Why am I gonna be yeah. talking about how great New York is when I'm getting paid here? Yeah. I'm gonna talk about you know, mm-hmm. you know what's happening and and you know and K Day and and. And and all these beautiful things in terms because I was a young kid. I couldn't get into the fun house when the yeah. fun house was popping. I couldn't right, get into right. Dance Interior and all the clubs in Brooklyn. I would hear stories. Yeah. But I was too young to even get into some of the block parties and the house parties. Yeah. I go to LA. Not only am I of age, but I am there at the infancy of hip hop. And I'm spitting in a way where dudes want to hear me. I yeah. remember there was something where some people that come from the East Coast and and um I think Jazzy Joyce was there and some other people were there and they were having mm-hmm. rappers go back and forth and Easy Easy E was sitting down. Easy E was chilling. He's like, "Young, go get him." Not mm-hmm. in a not in a disrespectful way, but it's like, "Young, show him what we got." And I went out there and I spit my heart out, dude. And Easy E Easy E Easy Dude, the Easy E. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, the, okay. And, I just want to make sure. Dude, there's some days, man. There's some days back in the day you talk to do you talk to guys at NWA? I've shared yeah. the stage with NWA. With 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 DOC and, yeah. and, and you you know I mean ghetto boys I mean yeah. I've shared the stage with a lot of people man and and when I was younger I knew I could spit and that's all I had right I right. I, I danced with the mic before I danced with a girl right, I, right. I, you know that was my that was my thing so I just had that on my shoulder and I used you know my intellect or whatever but but also that I wasn't cursing also that I was yeah. talking about different topics yeah. also that I was rhyming really fast yeah. you know what I mean yeah. all of those things. You know what I mean? I, all right, I'm gonna give you a couple stories, dude. I'm okay. gonna give you a couple stories. All right, cool, cool, cool. This ties in. This ties in with Tupac. I knew Tupac when he was in Digital. Okay. So Digital Underground before he went solo, I mm-hmm. you know would do would do shows with him and Shock and 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 Money B and and you know and really and really that whole crew. Okay. You know Eli, all of them. You know mm-hmm. later later on in years, but I knew I knew him from back then. Mm-hmm. So fast forward. Fast forward after, unfortunately, you know, God bless him, after he passed, I'm doing a promotional tour in like late 90s, something like that, for um, for one of my, my independent albums. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm at an elementary school and middle school. Okay. And these kids come up to me and they say, um, we, you know, we talked to Tupac before he passed and he mentioned you. Okay. I'm like, what do you mean he mentioned me? He's like, we were talking about the music that was out. The guys rhyming fast, like the dots effects, uh-huh. bone thugs, and all that other stuff. And he says, you know, this. They asked, I said, Tupac, what do you think of that? And he's like, that's a great style, but Young MC invented that style. Mm. Young MC started with fastest rhyme. He invented that style. He's the one. Wow. And and to hear them tell me that about him, that that warmed my heart. You yeah. know what I mean that that really warmed because that was my thing. Even being around digital, I was so envious of that group because they had such camaraderie. They would just get on the bus and city after city after city, yeah. and 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 Shock would do his thing. So then that's the Tupac angle, right? Yeah. And then, and then, unfortunately, like, like you know, shock, shock passed recently, mm-hmm. and I was thinking back in terms of my interaction with shock. I don't know if you've read or whatever, but I'm not a drinker, and that part mm-hmm. part of the reason I don't drink is I had a liver disorder when I was 12, 13 years old, and mm-hmm. I was told not to drink in my teenage years. And by the mm-hmm. time I got to, it got got to the point where I could drink in my late teens, early twenties, I just didn't like the taste of it. 
So right. I just, and I didn't like the feeling of not being in control of my body mm -hmm. when I had, you know, when I, when I had some something to drink. So I can, I can't even recall in my teens, early twenties, whatever, even, even being in a situation where somebody handed me a bottle and I took a swig. Cause I would usually just say pass, just like the weed, just pass. Mm -hmm. The one time I can remember I was in my thirties backstage, mm -hmm. a man handed me a bottle said we're going to toast to a certain person. I mm -hmm. took the bottle. I took a swig. And that's the last time I took a drink. Okay. That bottle was handed to me by Shock G. Wow. And we were, and we were toasting Tupac. Wow. And I swear to you, and I swear to you, that that's was that crazy. Was, that's probably about 20 years ago. Wow. And that is the, that's the last time I've taken a, 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 a bottle from a man and taken a drink. And that'll be the last time I do it till I die. Damn. Well, you picked a good one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But that, but, but, and once again, this is not something I thought of, but it's like, okay, it's shock who I love and respect yeah. musically and everything. And they know how I am. So he's not going to hand this to me just to, mm -hmm. just on some peer pressure shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's like, yeah. he's giving this to me on some real, like, we are toasting Tupac right now. This is the rest of digital here. You're here. We're involving you. You know, I'm yeah. not going to pass yeah. that bottle by, dude. So I, I took the swig. It was sweet, whatever it was. I didn't even know what it was, but right. I took the swig, passed it on, boom. And in his passing, I'm thinking, because I don't want to talk too much out of school, but I know Coolio was urgent even five years ago. Like, we got to help shock. We got to this. We got to that. And for me, I was I was a bit I was a bit apprehensive because I didn't really know what to do. And I'm I know how I how I enjoy my privacy or how I cherish my privacy. Mm -hmm. And if and if something's going wrong in my life or something negative happens in my life, I really don't want people trying to get involved, trying to tell me how to do stuff better. So I was like, okay, if y'all figure something out, y'all want to do an intervention, or whatever. I, you know, I guess I'll be down. I can, but nothing really materialized. But, but cool. I gotta tell you, man. People talk shit about Coolio. Coolio is one of the most heartfelt, you know, flag bearers for hip hop. Yeah. Like, I, dude, I could tell you stories about about Coolio and things that he's not only done for people, but how he's represented people and helped people yeah. in a way that people just don't know. Yeah. Uh, this '90s too, I've become really good friends with him. And right. and that Coolio, you know, we give each other crap or whatever, but Coolio's a good man, man. He's yeah. a, he's really he's really a good brother. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, real quick. Yeah. Um, you, can, can, I, I want to just get this clear, just just for myself and the people. I'm sure. Oh, by the way, Tone Loke is not my brother, not my kin. When I said my brother Tone Loke won a one yeah. Grammy, it was like a black euphemism. We are not related. So that, okay. that that we can put that to rest. But I get asked that a lot, so we can put that to rest on all hip hop, real quick. All right, yes. Tone, Tone, Tone. I always get the impression that he was a banger, banger. Like you know, from the Tone. Yeah, you, you know, yeah. you don't want to you don't want to mess with Tone Low. Yeah, you don't, yeah. you, you don't want to. We, we had some stuff go down in England on the bus, and there was other dudes in other groups. Like, damn, I didn't know Tone got down like that. I'm like, yeah, well, that's why you don't see people trying to get down with Tone like that. <laughs> right. Tone, Tone, yeah. is, Tone is legit. Tone got some dudes in his past and the whole nine y'all. Tone, Tone is legit, dude. So. And, yeah. and like I said, one of my best friends. So it's just like, you you know, it just kind of is what it is. It's when it's when people come with assumptions about people that, that mm -hmm. you kind of make the mistake. Like people make assumptions about me or make assumptions about cool or tone or, you know, other yeah. people, whatever. It's just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <it> alone. <laughs> I, I, but for the record, I remember yeah. Tone Loke before Wild Thing. Yes, sir. And before Funky Cole Medina, he had a song that uh, that sampled Jamaica Funk. Um, I, I, the name of it, I think... I, I, I can't remember oh, the name um, of it. I mean, it. Let's get it on. He had um, or got it going on rather. Yeah, I got it going on. Got it, got, got, it got it going, going on. on. Yeah, 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 got it yeah. going on. Yes. And then he had. There's some other ones, man. Loked after dark, Chiba Chiba. Yeah, he had, he, he had some. He had some joints, dude. Just yeah. like, just like me would let him know. And my name is Young and Know How. Yeah. Before Bust the Move, it's just like when you get a big when you get a big record like that. That crosses so much it like shines on, especially with me. Bust the Move stayed on the charts forty weeks. Just it just outshined everything else I had on the record. So I was I was really known for that. So that made it a little tough. But go ahead. I know you had a question. Go ahead, man. Um, just break down briefly the sort of like the so you didn't you wrote most of those records, but not right. all of them. Okay, this I wrote a version of Wild Thing. I gave them four verses. They took like two and a half of those verses. Okay. So Tone made some changes, gotcha. you know. And 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 they went on and did that. Funk, Funky Cole Medina, pretty much same way. We had and, and there, there was a record called Showtime because the Lakers were winning, so we we're mm -hmm. gonna make the third single Showtime. And I wrote a record called Showtime, but that never came, 
you know, the, gotcha. because at that point, you know, Wild Thing and Funky Kumadina had lasted so long. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, there almost wasn't time for a third single. Or if, if nothing else, if they were going to do a third single, they didn't want to come with something up tempo. Tone wanted to have something that was actually off his record as right. opposed to creating records, you know, to be singles and just throwing mm -hmm. them onto an album he already had. Now, now, when I listen to Funky Cold Medina, yes, I, he I hear a different record now, you yes. know, and I'm like, mm, I don't think we could make this record now. Oh, no, 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 no that's absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, and the funky, the, the funky thing, the funny thing about it is you don't see that in the time and I don't see it. I didn't. I didn't look at it as a date rape drug. I thought it was like yeah. someone wants a good drink, and it's right. like you know, love yeah. potion number love potion number nine wasn't a date rape drug. So right, date right. date date rape song or whatever. I yeah. I looked at um, I looked at at Wild Thing as a rap version of Love Potion Number Nine. That was that right. was the exact that was the exact picture that I had. Right. And I, I would never I would never go for oh yeah yeah drink something make a pass out and then go for yours. Now I, right. I just please I, yeah. it was not even in my sensibilities. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Having said that. Everybody picks apart so many lines now. Like the people trying to figure out what celibate rope means. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Bust the move. It's like, dude, that it just rhymes. And I talked about, you know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. yeah, just it, it's really. If I'm writing something in an hour and an hour and a half, I'm not putting that much thought into yeah. long term. What I'm making clever lines, and especially now when 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 you know the music is so in your face, mm -hmm. and there's no, you know, there, there's no, there, there's no, um, there's no analogies, there's no synonyms. It's just like yeah. You, you know, they wouldn't even say go to bed in the old Sugar Hill records. Go to, uh, you know what I mean? Right, like, right, right. You know what I mean? So so that to go from yeah. that, Wild Thing was a risky record. Yeah, you know, yeah. Bust the yeah. Move to, to a certain extent was a, you know, was it was a risky record. So yeah, you talk yeah. about what goes on now, huh? Right, 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 right. We'll get into that too soon. That's, too. No, yeah, yeah. But it's good. <laughs> I mean, look, man, it's what the artists do and it's what the people are yeah. buying. That's yeah. really the most important point. I don't think the artists step up and say, yeah, I'm going to turn the industry into blah, blah, blah. The industry tells them this is what's selling, yeah. whether it be the, the someone in the in industry themselves or somebody puts out a ratchet record and it goes multi platinum and, and they buy new homes. They're like, well, I guess I got to kind of make that music to to mm -hmm. go multi platinum. Mm -hmm. Okay, you yeah. know what I mean? I can't yeah. I can't hate on that because yeah. every industry has a chance to change. And I'm beyond the the thought process of somebody putting out a record and that representing all the hip hop. We're we're done yeah. with those days. You know yeah, what I mean? definitely. So, go ahead, dude. Yeah. Um. um... Bust the move, like, yes, sir. Like, like, like for people that don't know, the immensity of that record is 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 already is well known for our era. Um, uh, but but to speak to the content as a young man, younger than you, I have yes, to say that that record uh, was almost like my life story. You know, what <laughs> what I'm saying? like I was a shy dude. You know, I uh, you know was not the smoothest with the ladies. Sure. Yes, just, just about just about everything. Now I was fighting vigorously. I was, hey. I was like, "That's not," you know. I wasn't, yeah. you know, I wasn't like put putting a, a, a sign around my neck, like, "Yeah, this song is talking about me." But literally, it, it really was actually. Um, okay. So, so yeah, it's more of a statement, but it, but it, just to say that it was a very, uh, a very cool song to acknowledge, right? Where a lot of us were at that time. Right. So here's the interesting thing. And Chuck, you have stumbled on something that no one has ever asked me about that I've really not even thought much in depth about until you're, you're talking about it right now. But you're exactly right. Um, a big deal for me was to be real, was to be myself. And a rapper's persona in 88, 89 was I'm the greatest rapper. You, you can say even back to the to the early 80s when, when you heard you know, everybody from Sugar Hill to, you know, Funky Four, Phyllis Four, all them dudes, even, even Run DMC to a certain extent, you hear them talk about being with women, everybody's a pimp. Everybody's right. a pimp, has the greatest experience, has all this other stuff. And it's like, man, I wish I could be like them rappers. And then I'm turning around, I'm like, well, I'm a rapper right now, and I'm not like that. <laughs> let right. me let me talk about how I'm actually thinking in third person, by the way. Right. I never say I in Bust a Move. Just tell mm -hmm. him. Right. Third person. So everybody's relating, saying, okay, Young is telling a story, and I'm relating to this person in this story. Even if I'm putting some of my own life experiences into it, I never say I. Right, right. So, so I do the, yeah, the self deprecation, the striking out with women, fat soul, all that other stuff. All that comes in that is so anti what rap was at the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, what, and once again, it's not all my intent. That, you know, to have it have the significance that it's had over the years. 
Yeah. But rap was not doing those things at the time. Yeah. And I felt that there was a place for it for the nerdy kid, for yeah. the kid that didn't feel like he felt, you know, you know, fit in for the kid that was called names or rejected by women or rejected overall. Or, you know, for someone to, to think during down times, wow, there's someone that there's someone that, that that's going through it just like me, going through it just like me on a dance track with pretty women in it. And millions mm -hmm. of people are buying millions of people are buying the record. Yeah. But this is this is something that this is something I can definitely relate to. And yeah. I think that's helped me in terms of not only not only my longevity as an artist, but the licenses I'm getting, the commercials I'm getting. You know, we're talking we're, we're talking 30, 32, 33 years after release. And I'm I have major corporations still sampling, the, you know, still uh, mm -hmm. using the record in, in um in commercials and, and TV and movies. And it's got me motivated, man. I haven't recorded in. I haven't recorded in about 13 years. Mm -hmm. And by the end of this year, I'm gonna start recording some stuff and I will hit you up. You okay. Know, when, when, it, when it comes to that, because I need I, I've been talking to DJs and seeing how you know seeing how the music business has changed and the like, but you know, I kind of got the urge back because of not only how the industry has changed, but like you know, guys like you, man, you coming out and you telling me the influence that I had even on you. And dude, you're an icon in terms of what you've been able to do in terms of getting hip hop content across you know, across the internet. Yeah. That's, that's a big deal because black people ne were never usually at the, at the vanguard, at the front of technologies in general. You'd have black folk inventing things, mm -hmm. but it would usually be the more general population that, you know, that took advantage of it or was able to capitalize on it the most. Your hip hop, your hip hop site is a, is a flagship site, you know, Thank you. On, you know, you know, for the culture on, on, um, on, 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 on online. And that, mm -hmm. I think it's a I, I think it's a big deal. I want to acknowledge you for that. But having said that, it's like I'm seeing my little piece to have someone like you tell you tell me the influence that I had on you. Yeah. I'm like, well, maybe there's something there that I'm not seeing. When I say, oh, Marvin, you're done. You've made enough albums. You're maybe I'm not done, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe maybe in the context, especially after COVID. COVID COVID kind of pissed me off, to be honest. So I'm so I'm, I, I, I'm so. It was a personal thing in terms of. I didn't want to. It was cool before COVID for me to say, okay, I don't want to put out another record. Mm -hmm. Right? After COVID or during COVID, it was like, you can't put out another record. Mm. What do you mean, can't? Right, right. And once again, this is all internal. This is all Marvin's internal, you know, head games mm -hmm. going on. But that's what I felt. It's like, don't tell me I can't. Right. I ain't why. So I've been, the little monies that I've been getting when the shows were off, I've been buying equipment, updating stuff, right. you know, and, and, getting, and getting ready. And finally, I've had some song ideas coming in. And I have a big thing, dude, about how rap has slowed down. I don't know how much time you do, you got, but I'd love to discuss huh. this with you. Yeah, let's go. We're good. Um, when did rap, because I've talked to DJs about this. Uh -huh. When did rap go from, if you know about BPMs and rap songs? Somewhere, uh -huh. Yeah. When, when did rap go from being 95, 100 to 70? 65. <laughs> I mean, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I personally think, and I've been told this, that it's the, it's the syrup, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? That, that from the artists to the fans to the, and I'm not hating on, I'm just, mm -hmm. that has been a factor that has influenced the music. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm mm -hmm. saying, when did that happen? Where yeah. it's one thing that it's, it was okay. Cause at, at begin at the beginning, that was mostly like a Southern genre, somewhat of a mm -hmm. West coast to a certain extent, but even that was a piece of the genre. People would still make mm -hmm. dance records, and stuff, but it's like trap and that's it. And I'm I'm wondering like what what when 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 was that for you when when when, um, when, when do you think I, that was because you you obviously are a historian and you've been yeah. on top of it throughout this whole time so I love to hear that from you. Uh, it's hard for me to put a put a a, a finger on it, but I, I'll honestly put it around the Dr. Dre era. I would say that was the earliest really? beginnings. Yeah, because that was when we really started to permeate. But but wait, let me just continue okay. on. Yeah, That's yeah. when things cooled, you know, it calmed down, everything calmed down. But then then leapfrog until the early 2000s when lean and stuff started. to And, it, and, and I'll, I'll just stop you right there. The differentiation for me living through um, nothing but a G thing is it's pretty much the slowest record that he had. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. 82. That's true. And you still have records in the 80s with people rhyming. When it got below 70, that's slow jam territory. Yeah. You know what I mean in terms yeah. of DJing. So that was my thing. So, but but I'm saying early 2000s with the lean and everything. Yeah. That's what I that that's that's how I perceive it. Because yeah, and it, it never it, went it, away. Right. But 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 here's the thing. I'm I wasn't even looking for it to go away. But it's become 
Mm -hmm. It's become most like if you ask most DJs what BPMs they spin, they're going to tell you the 70 to 75 BPMs. If they're a hip hop DJ is the backbone of what they spin. Right. And, right. and that that is something that I'm just getting my mind around in terms of like, OK, if I'm making music to appeal to people, not only to appeal to that audience, but if I just want to make a record that they can mix with what they're playing. Right. You know what I mean? Like those yeah. are the things I think of. Like before, before Pen Stroke One, I've been doing this thirty years, dude. Right. I'm not gonna. Right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make a record you can't play. You may yeah. like it, but it's not. It's not the BPM right now. So I'm trying to get to the mindset of that. And so, so people might take this like I'm not disrespecting it. I'm trying to understand it because right. I'm coming from a place where you know you had white lines at one sixteen, and that was the rap record. You had rap records over over one ten, and then they slowly went down to one hundred, and then you yeah. had. Your golden era period where everything was like 90 to 100 or 90 to 105 and everything kind of landed in there. You may have a little bit below 90, a little bit above 105, but everything landed in, for the most part for me in that 15 BPM range. Right. And then that range changed. Mm -hmm. And usually if you were to say, I'm going to take this range and I'm going to move it 15, 20 BPM, there has to be a seminal moment. There has right. to be something to say, yeah. okay, this... You know what I mean? And, and and I don't see it from where I am as a as I just, a fan, I as, think an, it's, as an artist. It's drug culture. I mean, it's as yeah. simple as that. It's drug culture. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to have to think. They don't want to have to like, mm, let me, what's he saying? Or 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 go hard. You know, I, 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 I recently rapped a record the other day, and I, I, I literally performed it as if it was my own full blast. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, this is, <laughs> this is hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? But if you slow that down, you're like oh, okay, and 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 you know the other thing is, people's not like people's bandwidth mentally right. is not always there either. So, so you want to have you want to have more space down, between bring it down yeah. and have more space between the ideas. Yeah, and let people you, you know let, let Biggie's people, biggest record was juicy, but not because right. it was his best record. It was his simplest record. You know what right. I mean. And mm -hmm. and also people's people's time to release and people's time to wind down from the outside world. The last thing they want is aggression and stress right. and speed. Yeah. They want to lean back. So culture wise, I think it helps, but the lean obviously obviously you know contribute to it too. But I get you in terms of I get you in terms of the laid back records like the juicy and the G things and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. To me, those were always a part of it. So you say, okay, right. when I want to chill, I want to lean back. This is this is what makes hip hop you know v variable. This is what gives hip hop its you know. It, it's multicultural, whatever you know. There's different approaches, but they emerged as dominant, though. That's how I see it. They emerged yeah, no, as right. the biggest records. You're no, no. You're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I don't know, man. I, I still like aggressive music, personally. You know, that's just there, uh, there's that's a there's preference. a place for it. the the yeah. funny thing is the funny thing is is that I plan to make at least one, if not a couple records in that BPM range. Okay. And I and and the two artists that got me into it, you know. Because I won't say uh, I've listened to other artists in that speed, and a lot of times I'll turn on Hip Hop Nation, and everything sounds the same, dude. I'm just yeah. I'm yeah. trying to find, you know what I mean? But J Cole, mm. J Cole, J J Cole on the spitting range, that dude, that dude can rhyme in a way. The way I described it to my boy Knox, that dude rhymes in a way like he's in a car reclining, like he's mm -hmm. comfortable doing the mm -hmm. most acrobatic lyrical things like it's just okay today's tuesday i'm around like this right otis b's going i'm around like this and just yeah. his rhyme schemes it's just amazing and the fact yeah. that he can take that and sing along with it like in my day you wanted to be melodic that was like that was like an obstacle course to be able to get right. through the industry that would accept you being melodic and you know and and cadence based at the same yeah, time yeah, yeah but so so you take jake cole on the lyrical end and then i'm gonna I'm blow your mind with this and whatever on the musical end, who got me into that BPM BPM range is Skrillex, the producer Skrillex. Mm, if yeah. you listen, if you listen to what he does with yeah. syncopation, yeah. seventy to eighty BPM, just in that slow range, but you 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 find your head bobbing double. Mm -hmm, you know, to mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. Skrillex, yeah. J Cole. It it it's wow. it's the most bizarre thing, but it's like because I'm trying to find a way to get in to say okay, yeah. I'm feeling what this person is doing musically. I'm feeling what this person is doing lyrically, and it's been those two. <laughs> so, nice, nice. Crazy, J. Cole, J. Cole and Skrillex. Oh, yeah, my. I mean, that, yeah. I mean that's, that's what I've been listening to. Yeah. He, he has a great, Skrillex has a great record with uh, Rick Ross that's incredible. If you look it, look, look check it out. It starts okay. out as a Rick Ross record and then it just goes boom left. and then it, yeah. and it goes left. Um, who, 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 how are you feeling about hip hop nowadays? How do you feel about that game? I think, I think the music 
it's fine. I always worried about the industry. Yeah. Because the artists are going to make what the artists are going to make, and then the fans will decide. But when you right. have people getting in the way saying this is the kind of music that we'll make and we'll program a certain way to get get the most streams and we'll use bots and stuff like that, that has nothing to do with music, dude. Right. Yeah. Those are the things that get me concerned about the hip about hip hop in the music industry. Right. Those things. Those manipulative outside factors. Right. Right. If you just the the one beautiful thing about 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 uh you know the internet culture is that artists can touch people directly. Yeah. They can touch people with music, release when they want, all that, all that stuff. So I think those positives outweigh the negatives of people trying to ma manipulate it because there's so much music and so mm -hmm. many ways to get a hold of that music that um that, that fans can find things. Mm -hmm. It's just when you have a record that you want to blow out big, unless you got a ton of money and know everybody in the world, it's really difficult to get it to people and have them pay attention. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and um even the, the phenomenon, I'd like to hear your, you know, your, your thoughts on this in terms of J. Cole's last record coming out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, he's a genius, dude. How does yeah. he only chart? How does he only have one single chart? Well, Jake Cole is he's more of an, an iconic kind of guy. You know, he's like um he, he's also a recluse. I mean, uh, reclusive might be a strong word, but he's he's he stays to himself, you know. Dude, which is, dude, which is yeah. fine. But I'm saying I'm saying in terms of the artistry, it's like just out of curiosity, if you had someone have an impact like that, you can even look at Drake's records and the impact that Drake had and the curiosity. So when he puts out a new, you know, he puts out the new album, all of a sudden, you know, the, the streaming services are playing everything, you know, a, you know, a record every hour and a bunch of records chart first week and that kind of stuff. And I think the listenership has, you know, the, the attention spans have gotten so small that it's like, okay, I like this one record. And I'm going to listen to this one record. I know they gave me 15, but I'm going to just listen to this one. I'm going to react to this one. And then the industry only responds to that one, even right. though all those ones are out. And then the idea of trying to put out a second, third, fourth single, people may have listened to the whole album and they picked their favorite one. And then that's it. You know what I mean? And, and, yeah, and man. That, that's, that's affecting the way the artists are putting out music now. Absolutely. I mean, you can't even get a song over three minutes. I mean, barely three minutes. You I, know. I, I'll tell you this. And I, I'll tell you that real quick. If Busted Move were to come out right now, if Busted Move were to come out right now, it runs at 420, that it say take out a verse, take out mm -hmm. a hook, and, and take out the break. Yeah. And make it. And, yeah, and, and, exactly. and, and literally, I have four verses, Yeah. four hooks, one double at the end, but four verses, four hooks, and a break, plus, plus an intro, 12 bar intro. There's no way. There's no and the way. break is the best part. Like, well, not the best, but the, the break is part of the song. Yeah, that's I, one I, of the best parts. I have a fifth verse that I do over that break live, really? and I and I did it on one remix. Okay, I did it on one, and everybody's been hitting me up for that verse. What, uh, there would be no, I no one would ever con conceive of making a fifth verse to any song ever right, right, in right. the 2020s, Definitely. let alone the 2010s. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh. Hmm. Let's talk about all in the same gang or same yes, gang. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, that record, the process of it being made, your part in that, um, and how did it feel actually to be on that record? It, it was very much a who's who. It yes. Was a huge, huge moment in uh, in hip hop. It was a huge moment, and I'll I'll just you know put another fun fact out there. Me and Tone Loke were the only two artists to be in both the All in the Same Gang and the Self Destruction videos because they called oh. us to come out to Self Destruction before right. I think I think even before All in the Same Gang was thought of. Right. And right. we were in, we were in a Self Destruction video. That's <clears> crazy. And then and then we went back and had verses in All in the Same Gang. And ironically, within the last two years, I guess in 2018. Okay. 2018 to 2019, I started doing same uh, my same gang verse. My 16, I do that in my show. Wow. You know what I mean? And yeah. you know, you know who I saw do his? And oh. I said, okay, shock. Shock was shock G was the only person. Now, mind you, NWA's are going out. I'm not, you know, I'm not seeing most of these guys. Shock G was the only person doing his same gang verse in his show. And I said, yeah. you know what? This would be a good thing for me to do. Let me do my yeah. same gang verse. Wow. And and he's the direct influence. I saw mm. him do it. I'm like, I got 16 good bars in that song. Yes, you do. You know what I mean, I got 16. And they only put eight on the single, but 16 on the album. I'm like, I need to do that. And mm. I'll give you the experience. Hey, hey, working with Dr. Dre, the one mm -hmm. time that I worked with him, mm -hmm. I learned so much just from him being himself. 
uh-huh. and and getting from me what he needed, but allowing me to be me at the same time. Right. So I walk in and I'm assuming that the hook is coming in after me. You ain't got to tell I'm, I'm young MC. I got great. What are you talking? The hook's coming in after me. Right. So yeah. when I finish my verse, I'm like, we all in the same gang. I mean, I, right. I emphasize. Right. He's like, yo, the verse is strong, whatever, whatever. Just, you know, tighten it up on the end there a little bit. You know, the, you know, we, we want to be able to move you around. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and I understand because he's got like a dozen artists and he's only got a, a certain number of hooks. Yeah. So brothers killing other brothers and boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? And yeah. and um, I learned so much. It helped me not only be a better artist producer, but when I directed my my movie, mm-hmm. I directed my a movie called Justice Served, at you know finished in twenty fifteen whatever. Anyway, okay. When I, when when I, when I did the movie, my second day being a director ever, I'm directing Lance Henriksen. Wow. All right. In some of the heaviest scenes of the movie, people are crying. Women on set are crying. Some of the most dramatic scenes in the movie. But this is when we could get Lance to act in the movie. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm directing him. And when I'm directing him, he's a method actor. So he's going off script a little bit. And I remember mm-hmm. what Drake, like if if Lance did something that messed up my plot, then I would stop him. But mm-hmm. Lance has acted in enough movies to know this is what Marvin needs from his plot. But this is what I need as an actor. So mm-hmm. I let him go. And some of his ad libs are some of the best stuff in the movie. But I remember mm-hmm. Dre in that moment. Right. Because when I was coming in saying I got to do this and I got to do that. As long as it didn't, the stuff that affected him in terms of creating the entire All in the Same Gang record, uh-huh. he he made he, he he had me change. But the stuff that allowed me to be me, even though I wasn't you know originally from the West Coast, even though I never gang bang, even though I wasn't cussing and stuff or talk about selling drugs or shooting anybody or whatever, uh-huh. he allowed me to be me, and I was able to give my best performance for him, and I was able to translate that in terms of working with another artist. So, so when you guys all together, they were all separate. How oh, no, separate, separate, separate. Yeah. Look, I mean, to be honest, I was never told this explicitly, but just knowing that culture at the time, you don't know, even if you have an idea who the artist may be affiliated with, mm-hmm. you yeah. don't know who the people they're with are affiliated with. Yeah. Or if somebody in their, in their crew might have mm. done something to piss somebody else off right. or there's a beef outstanding that nobody knows about up until some shit happens at the studio. Yeah. So I literally came in by myself. Right. right. Did mine and then left. Yeah. Not that anybody would have beef with me, but I'm just saying that's how it was done. We were, we were brought in, yeah. we were brought and then we were brought together for the video, but you talk about security for the video. Whoa. Security that didn't wear uniforms. More, more like, more like cell block security in oh, terms yeah. of the, in terms of the look. Right and, these are, right, and these are all dudes I get along with. My conception is, a, you know, I yeah. hung with Mike because my conception is a good man, and he did he did a lot in terms of, in, yeah. in, in terms of getting that mindset changed. Right, you know what I mean. Right. And even even before I was sponsored in clothing by Mike Christian, mm-hmm. Mike Christian mm-hmm. was a bodybuilder, and he had some ties, at, you know. Yeah. And so I had known about that from before, even even when I was doing Casa Skateland World on Wheels, realizing, yeah. oh, you can't wear this color into this neighborhood. I'm coming from the East Coast. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing about that. Right. I really right. don't. So this mm-hmm. was this was all stuff I grew into. And the one thing I did do, dude, coming from the East Coast, you can you you can have an idea like, okay, we know everything. And I knew getting there quickly that I did not know everything. And I kind of stepped back and watched. Mm-hmm. And was able to really able to respect a lot of what the artists did. So yeah. my love for the West Coast is eternal. You know what I mean? It just yeah. it, it yeah. just and I always rep and I always stand up for the West Coast because not only did they give me my shot and my break, but I was able to witness so much beauty in terms of hip hop from the West Coast. Yeah, that's what's mm-hmm. up. Yeah. Um, how did it feel when things began to change for you? Uh, you started to see the more aggressive rap forms taking dominance you know nwa and then the drama i mean the beefs i mean it was it was kind of crazy to see that you know nwa just as an example didn't have i'm listening three, i'm just going to turn three go albums ahead, I'm listening. okay go you know, ahead. I'm, I'm listening. Go ahead. yeah then suge knight and then you know even the drama around Pac, and then you're this clean college educated artist and everything's changed. Um, what, what 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 were you like? You know, at that point as an artist, how did you feel? I mean, as an artist personally, I felt fine. And the reason mm-hmm. I say this, Chuck, is, is is look, I came into the music industry, came into the hip hop industry, knowing that I was different from 
everybody else or different from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I just wanted the opportunity to get my ideas out and get my message mm -hmm. across and, and be able to exist and survive in the music business the way it was. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do that. When I got success, I didn't, I, I didn't get success assuming that everybody was going to be like me. Right. I assumed that I would have my lane. Other people would have their lanes and the lanes would continue to be fine. It was mm -hmm. only when, you know, I won't even say the artists because the artists, artists really don't care who else is in. They want to do their thing. It's the industry. Mm -hmm. Like let's, let's try and make it where we can make more aggressive, more ratchet, more whatever, be the pop music and let's squeeze out. Let's, let's, let's make that corny. You mm -hmm. know, if they don't curse, if they don't talk about, you know, the stereotype of, of you know, of, 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 of a rapper's life or hip hop life or black life or urban life. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like, let, 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 let's make, if they, if they don't, if they don't fulfill that stereotype, let's make, let's call that corny and push them out. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't going for that. I knew that I could rhyme with the best of them. I knew I could get mm -hmm. my ideas out with the best of them. And I knew I could make music that could either make your head nod or, or make you dance. Mm -hmm. I knew I could do it because I've been doing it. Yeah. So I, I just stuck to my own. I mean, I guess the most, the, the hardest push was the, what's the flavor record? When I worked with, um, with, with Ali Shaheed and, okay. you know, and, yeah. and I was, I was making my music still, it was the most urban or the, you know, or the most, the most street, I guess, is, that young MC could get, but mm -hmm. it was still, it was still me. Yeah. So I felt, okay, this is me stretching, but I'm not going to start cursing. I'm not going to change my name. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to do these things to, to be somebody I'm not because I just had a, a, you know, a successful run being me. Yeah. So if, you know, if I'm going to be me and that's not, and, and that's not trendy right now, so be it. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to chase trends. Now, if I had never had success, you might be able to push me in a certain direction. But the mm -hmm. fact that I had success being me, oh, hell no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, no, it no. was, it's always funny for me when hammer, uh, Oh yeah, switched, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It up a little. And I was like, uh, and I and this is from the guy that just loved to get it started, dance, and you know I was doing those dances too, to see him doing things that I was just like, oh no no don't please call Hammer don't do that. I was just talking to my friend my my, my boy DJ Bro Rev, out of out of uh, he's out of he's out of uh, North Carolina actually, mm -hmm. and we were saying how I, I believe it's Pumps in a Bump. Yeah, that is an underrated. Yeah, I mean, it is. And, 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 and it's an underrated record. And here's the thing. A yeah. lot of it goes to who's on the record. Right. If if Tupac had rhymed um, Holla If You Hear Me over the Pumps and a Bump beat, mm -hmm. that would be a hip hop classic. Right. Because, yeah. Yeah. because around the same speed, same kind of vibe, but it's Hammer right. over that beat. So people, you know, the criticism yeah. comes as the criticism comes. But the beat is dope. That song is dope. That song I was, is dope. I was, I was speaking more to the visuals uh, in the song than the song itself. Yeah. But continue. I'm sorry. But I'm saying, but but Chuck, stop, stop for a second. If the song mm -hmm. is dope, if the song is dope, the video is going to affect the way you feel about the song. Oh yeah. Well, uh, come on. Like now we're talking. Now we're di we're we're getting into the MTV becoming. You know the sure, BTS no. and the MTVs being the predominant selling point of music. You know, it changed everything. I mean, it was before that because Michael Jackson definitely changed everything. Yeah, but, yeah. but then, you know, we're me. I know I was just fixated in front of the TV watching all of it. You know, right? You know, for, personally, right. I just well, you know, I didn't want to see Hammer and Speedos. I'll just be honest. You know, no, I get just, it. It's not what I, I want it. to see. No, no, no. I no, I get it. I get it. But then, you know, for me, I'm just looking at it in terms of an, of an artistic growth and. Uh -huh you know, his bravery in terms of choosing that track. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. at some point, he had a choice of what he was going to put out. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I want that. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, 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 that to me, that, that was brave. I mean, yeah. there, there, there's something to that. Love, love, love MC Hammer. Don't get, mm -hmm. don't nobody. Oh, no, no, no. As, as do yeah. I, dude. I'm, hey. Yeah. I just, I just did some shows with him recently, you know, like, uh, in 19. In 19, we did, mm -hmm. did several shows together. Yeah. So let's talk about the hate. We got now that we got Hammer, we got you know Tone Loke. I, I don't really recall hate from Tone. Not, from Tone no, no, but not, not as much. Coolio no. definitely gets his hair share of hate. The, the the thread though is that you guys were so popular, you weren't New York rappers either. You weren't right. East Coast based, right? And right. um, you know, I even once said, and I said this to Hammer himself, or I might have put it on social media and had him 
added, and I felt bad after I did it. And I said, he, he was a guilty pleasure. And I was like, oh, why did I say that? You know, but that's but that, coming. But that's that's coming. a knee jerk. That's a knee jerk reaction. If you right. if you're if you're a New York hip hopper with a New York hip hop collection and and, mm -hmm. and and all the posters on the wall, and then you listen mm -hmm. to Hammer, it's like yeah. you know one of these things is not like the other. But it's right. meant to be like that. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. The point I was going to make earlier when we brought up the hate, and I'd forgotten it, is that I was really personally affected by the hate, right up until the point the Chronic came out. And then mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, it's Dre's rapper for the West Coast. And he got the street stuff that's love all day. And then I started seeing people call Dre a sellout as soon as the chronic went platinum. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I'm like, oh, it's not about the music. It's yeah. about the fact that he's selling more than you are. Yeah. So I right. took it all in perspective. And it's like, okay, whenever I, it, any criticism I see of anybody I like, what I consider the source. You yeah. know what I mean? Because, because anybody who's in this game knows how tough it is. And whatever yeah. lane you can carve out, you have respect for the man that can carve out his lane. Yeah. Now, what about the love? I mean, on the oh, flip yeah, yeah, side, no, the love is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. <clears throat> the love is great in terms of where it where it came, dude. I have people in places I've never been, and the weirdest stories. I think the greatest one that I know of um, is before nine eleven. Okay. When Bush, this is the, in late two thousands, and, and you know, elected obviously in November. So really, in the early two thousand and one, when Bush was taking a lot of vacations uh -huh. in Texas, if you remember, right. There was a karaoke party on his on his you know ranch private presidential property or whatever. Mm -hmm. And Ari Fleischer, who was the spokesman, mm -hmm. got up in front of the president, or at mm -hmm. least the White House staff and whatever, and did a perfect rendition of Bust and Move on karaoke. <laughs> and and literally, do you know where I found out about that story? My mm -hmm. financial advisor sent me the story that was a clip out of like either US News or World Report or Business News or something like that. A mm -hmm. total financial whatever magazine, the furthest thing away from mm -hmm. hip hop, but Ari Fleischer did a perfect bust and move that's on man. karaoke. That is and, that, and, and, and yeah. mind you, that's 21 years ago. Right, right, right. And, and you know what I mean? And the record was 12 years old at the point. Right, right. That's crazy. That's dope though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, at the end of bust and move, you say move it, boy. And yeah. I always felt like you were talking directly to me. <laughs> oh, no. At the, at the, I mean, I just... You that, know, was more, that was that was more my flavor flavor Im Im imitation. Oh, for real? Yeah, that, that, that may be why he tackled me during my Grammy. I don't I don't uh, know, but 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 no, yeah. that's more my, that's more my flavor flavor Im imitation than, than anything else. I would you know. No, I mean it, it was just like you know it, it was it was all in like just this story form, and then you're finally yeah. given a command like move it, boy. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I guess. I mean, yeah. it, it it at at that point it's more of an ad lib, and I may have been frustrated that I didn't say any me me me. You know right. what I mean? So, yeah. so like you got all the story now. Move it. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. Move, move it. So yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. So um, here we are in the you know since we're going to talk again. Now that I know that. Oh yeah, um, yeah, no, for sure. We'll, we'll definitely keep some for the for the next time we talk. But sure. Um. Uh, you you mentioned you you've touched on a number of things. What what's life like for you now? You know what life. Life is kind of enlightened for me now. Like I, I've taken a lot of pressure off of myself. Um, you gotta, you gotta think about it. If I write wild thing in in thirty five minutes, I write funky Cole Medina in an hour, bust a move in an hour and a half. You throw in know how and principal's office. You can say probably six to eight hours of actual time mm -hmm. has created. I don't know, 90% of my income <laughs> yeah. since, since I've been 21, 22 years old. And so you could imagine, okay, I picked up a pen for 35 minutes and gave two and a half verses to a record that sold for four million copies. Or I, I wrote Bust and Move in an hour and a half and that changed my life and sold, you know, has made people, not me, but made people in general a gross of like, you know, millions of dollars and the like. Um, imagine the pressure of picking up a pen, putting it in your hand and saying, okay, I'm going to write something now. Yeah. And say, what, what what's going to be? So I've taken a lot of that pressure off of myself because- That's if people want to get deep, um, I would do homages to like, I'm, I'm into making beats. I love making my beats. I have a record called Hot One on my Adrenaline Flow album that's almost like an homage to Swiss Beats. And okay. when I made it, when I made it, I was hyped on it. And then when I finished it, I'm like, oh my God, this is too close, too close. It's one of the strongest records on the album. I ended up putting it 10th on the album, never released it as a single, never really put any focus on it. I listened to it the other day because I was submitting tracks to try and get some um, 
I was submitting tracks to try and get some some uh, license placements. I'm like, this is a strong record. And I listened to it and I realized I was so caught up with the idea that, oh my God, I'm you know, I'm too close to a, to a person's style and, and I'm not as much of myself and blah, 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 that I didn't put I didn't put my talent out there the way I should. And now I'm, I'm at a point with so much music flowing around that it's like, okay, I can show my talents. I can, whatever I do, I'm going to be me. And, and, and those things, taking those pressures off myself, because you have, you have early success, you have success early on like that. And it's like the story I told about Springsteen saying he felt sorry for me that I went platinum on my first record. Mm -hmm. It's like, where do you go? Where do you go when you go platinum first? Because you're not going to be new again. You don't have 20 years to make your second record. You only got one year or two. Mm -hmm. um, people have preconceived notions about you. The rhymes you want when you're 13 are already on the first record. You know what I mean? You're coming from a place where, you know, you got your silk sheets and you're trying to, you know, mm -hmm. act like you're hungry. Mm -hmm. All of those pressures, all of those pressures. I've been away from it so long and I've been underrated so long. Not that what people think of me is a big deal, but just saying that's the kind of the environment that if I was to come with something strong and something I know I can make right now, I, you know, I think I, I could really I could really make some good things happen. So that's that's where my mindset is. And I, I, I have a beautiful lady in my life and she's really supportive and has taught me a lot of things as well. So. You know, I'm 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 in a good space. Okay, good. You know, it's funny. Uh, just a few weeks ago, actually in June, I was listening. I was looking at a a, a movie, and 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 I, I heard this faint voice in the background. I was like, "Who's what? Let me Shazam this." And it ended up being "Just Say No," Young oh, MC. Oh wow! Yeah, I never even knew they got licensed. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's from my first record. But yeah, yeah, I get it. I yeah, get it. no, it was just it was just. I mean, it wasn't and, even loud. You know, you know who produced that track? Who? QD3, Quincy Jones' son. Ah, that's my I, man. I went to I went to school with Tina. Okay. And I used I used to go over the house, you know, and mm -hmm. and and the like. So I met you know Rashida, and, and I mean I, I used to I used to hang out there and and yeah. Snoop Cute. Snoopy as they would call him. Right. That that, that was QD3. You know that it, he he went and he produced that joint, you know, produced that joint with me, and we hung out, and it was a good look. It was it was a good, and I that helped form his musical talents. Mm -hmm. You know, I really looked at, at producing a different way just from being in the studio with him, and I insisted on working with him because the Delicious guys were doing everything, and I wasn't yeah. in the studio with the Dust Brothers. I would just hear the stuff afterwards, but right. I was in the studio with Matt and Mike. I said, well, at least let me get one over here. Right. You know I, mean? <laughs> I played a little keyboard. I played the. The the keyboard on my name is Young. I played the bass line on on I Let Him Know live. We we didn't have you know uh, syn syncopation or whatever at that point. If I messed yeah. up, they rewind the tape back and have me play along with it. I played the whole thing. You know what I mean? Nice, so, nice. You know, boom, 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 and I'm you know I'm not the greatest player, but I was able to you know get those out. So just going through those experiences, I know Tones records were made on a 16 track to start. You know, some of mm -hmm. my records were made initially on a 16 track. All of that stuff, man. It's like. Whatever complaints I may have had or whatever, it is it has formed such a base in me right now yeah. that I can literally see the tracks as I make them, and you know, and it's 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 a, it's a beautiful thing. So I'm kind of looking forward to making music because the 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 interesting thing is, if I was an executive and I was behind a desk, mm -hmm. I'd be in my prime right now. Right. I would right. I would be if I was a CEO yeah. if I was an executive and a lot of my friends that went to high school, Hunter College High School. Shout out Joy for the lead, eighty five. If I if I was in a regular straight job, I'd be in my prime right now. Right. Brain at the best, yeah. you know. Experience to not make same, yeah. not make the same mistakes twice in right. in entertainment in general. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's different. Although I will say, the whole environment of people giving flowers now is mm -hmm. allowing us is giving us a path to come back. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Be I because agree. The, the difference of the music now, it, it's so different that people are yearning. You know, if if all they're listening to is stuff from the from the eighties, nineties. You know, up to 2000, they're kind of yearning for more of that style that may yeah. not be in today's music. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so that 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 gives uh that that gives let uh, uh let um what do you what do you call it? Legacy artists that gives legacy right. artists like me a lane to get right. back in. Mm -hmm. So 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 young MC stole Cole Ryman. I gotta get from you. Uh oh, your top five dead or alive rappers. Oh man, yeah. I hate doing this because my list my list is so come long. On. Oh come on, give us. It, it, I'll make it simple. All you have to do is give us those that most highly impacted your life. Oh boy. Now I know you can break it down there. I mean, 
or it can all be. Right. All right, I'm gonna give you. It doesn't have to be five, but you know. Oh no! All right, I'm I'm gonna give you underrated ones I okay. don't hear. I'm ones I don't hear on people's lists. Okay. That you know what I mean? Okay. DJ Quick is an underrated rapper. As a sure. rapper, West Coast representing DJ Quick. Listen to Down Down Down. It's incredible. Yeah. All right. True, true, true I'm give, all right. New Yorker, you ready for this? Okay. Starang Wonder, Boot Camp Click. Oh, that's that, a good one. That, you talk about someone who influenced me. Yeah. I'm, I, I saw him in, in concert once. I don't think I've ever met him, met him because Sean Price had walked by me or whatever, but I never. Starang Wonder. Wow. I met him one time, and when I did, I said, hey, take this picture right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see him out and about a lot. Right. So yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Well, I well I put this rapper in another category, but I, I'd say influences or whatever. Twister. Yeah. People, oh, yeah. People, talk about, people talk about Twister having a style. No, mm -hmm. Twister rhymes faster than anybody. Now, now, not only does he rhyme faster, but that man hits consonants mm -hmm. in a way. And me and him have a mutual respect for each other because he hears how I flow. But mm -hmm. that dude is yeah, dangerous. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Yes. And, I, and, and I'll say another one, controversial, whatever, Eminem. If yeah. Eminem was black, he would be in everybody's top five, if not top three. But you don't hear of him because he's a white rapper and I can't put a right rapper and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Well, I Eminem disagree with you there. I think that it's the opposite. But I'll... What? I can... No, no, no. Let, let me, no. let me hear and it. The reason, and, and well, I, I'll, I'll disagree respectfully, of course. No, no, but no. I, I, do think, I do think, and this is no knock against Eminem. He even did a song about it called White America. So mm. this, the, he says it himself. It ju I just think that the, the whiteness and the blonde hair and the blue mm -hmm. eyes uh, and some of the rebranding, because once he got with Dre, he did, you know, they, they, they formed him. Yeah. Uh, it, it helped. Those records were huge. Uh, in a way that didn't exist when he was just battling. So, and I always use Royce the Five Nine as my example because those guys were so very closely related as artists, and um, and closely related. Period. You know. Okay, but I'm I'm gonna counterpoint you with this. Okay. You did you see Nicki Minaj rhyming on those smack on those on those uh, what come up tapes when she was on when when she was Fendi? Yeah. So she she would do her little verses and 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 she was spitting in those. And mm -hmm. you take that Nicki Minaj to what she's packaged as now, yeah. I still hear the skill. And for me, I can look through, mm -hmm. you know, all you know, all all, all the, the glitz and glamour and whatever to, mm -hmm. to who she is as an artist. And I respect her and to say she's just about the strongest female MC to me. Mm -hmm. And 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 she can be that regardless of what, what she's dressed in, what color it is, whatever, whatever. I look at him and then that way. That mm -hmm. if he wasn't white and he didn't have blonde hair and he didn't have blue eyes and he wasn't packaged like that and he just had his spit. And yeah. you put him, you put him through a vocoder, and you put his cadence against anybody else's cadence. I put him up there. But yeah, the he's packaging, there. the packaging, the packaging, and the presentation, and how people, the, whatever issues people have with that, yeah. that's where the controversy to me comes in. Yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. as a as a straight MC, no, 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 no. Eminem is Eminem is ridiculous. Absolutely Eminem is ridiculous. What he does with rhyme scheme, and even mm -hmm. even in the movie with him writing in a circle like that, it dude, there's just. It, 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 it's special. It's special. I with agree. That, with, no, with there's no, has. yeah, no, no. Don't get me misquoted. I agree yeah. with you on that. Um, I would say, just, just because he's well, I know him well, good friend to like, but Tretch, Tretch is an MC mm -hmm. is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, and and what he yeah. did, and 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 he sounds comfortable over stuff that yeah. that's really difficult to do. Yeah. Method Man, yeah. look, Method Man. There's some solo stuff that Method Man had on one of the, one of the Takao. I think it was oh the 420 record or one one of the. It's amazing, and and these records didn't really take hold nationwide, but they are incredible records. And his spit is just yeah, you yeah. know, it, it's just it's just incredible. I'm looking at it from an artist standpoint. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's just like you know, and then then you can categorize people in terms of um. You know, me and my boy were having this talk the other day, and we made a comparison that if you take Keith Murray uh -huh. and, and you take Corrupt, uh -huh. that Keith Murray is an East Coast version of Corrupt, and Corrupt is, an, is a West Coast version of Keith yeah. Murray. In terms of yeah. how they use multi-syllables, and they I mean, don't sound anything alike, but in terms of how I yeah. envision them 
and yeah. and corrupt corrupt I know you know I haven't seen yeah. him in a while but but Keith Murray I you know yeah grew yeah. listening to him were like but I'm hearing corrupt and I'm hearing you know the things I'm, I'm feeling the things I felt when I listened to Keith Murray yeah so you're you know, an M I, MC's MC well dude here's the thing I'm a scholar I'm I, I mean I'm a student and a scholar of it yeah. and because this is what I do. And if I want to be nice, I'm not going to act like, like a lot of people with, like with Twister, a lot of people act like Twister don't exist. Or Buster, when he goes crazy with his flows, that he don't exist. Or Tech 9 don't exist. These brothers exist. Yeah, they do. They, just because they can rhyme faster than you can speak, yeah. they exist. Yeah. So I, I took it upon myself to say, okay, if I'm a rhyme as fast as anything I hear, which is my thing for the longest time, I want to make sure I'm understood. Right. I want to make sure 30 second notes come out of my mouth and you can understand everything that I'm saying. Yeah. And that was then that was my thing. So I'm anxious to hear, you know, what I mean, when these guys are coming out with the with the crazy stuff and I'm like, OK, you know, there's the bar. <laughs> there's right, the, right, right. Even, even at 54 years old, there's a bar. I got to shoot for it. You know what I yeah, mean? So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Marvin Young, young MC. Thank you, man. I, I want to say thank you, man. It's a true honor thank and you, a Chuck. privilege to interview you and to, you know, have your number. I'm like, oh, oh man, I got oh, we anytime. were texting. Yo, yes, we're texting anytime, Chuck. Anytime because you have your pulse on stuff. You know, like I've ever since you know I, I mentioned it, ever since that Fresh Era podcast, I've been yeah. doing interviews with different people, and that that was yeah. what caused you to reach out to me. But yeah. Yeah. but I'm I'm getting access to people that have their finger on the pulse of the hip hop industry, like I don't have. So I'm gonna right. reach out to you. Okay. I'm gonna reach out to you with questions as I'm yeah. creating stuff. Because okay. I, 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 my left brain and my right brain, they, they kind of mash together. I can't make the music without thinking about where it's going to go yeah. and who, yeah. how it's going to get to people. Then, then I would have questions for you of like, yo, Chuck, when, when this came out, what happened? When, when, you know, when, yeah. what, what, what records, what records do you think were underrated? What, what, what did people do wrong? I'd love to hear those things from you. Yeah. Love whenever, you. whenever you, whenever you're Absolutely. ready, any, at Absolutely. any time. Yeah. You got it. You got All it. Right. One Thank day, you, next time we'll talk about that heat out there in Arizona and how you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't. You, it's 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 hard to take it. It's a yeah. it's a great place, and that's another thing. I'm 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 trying to work with uh, you know, working with some kids on the on the scene out here. You know okay. what I mean? And do and do more stuff locally because you don't have a lot of records. You have a lot of artists out here, mm -hmm. but you don't have a lot of records broken out of Phoenix or out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. there's there's no reason for that. We should have more records being broken out of here. So absolutely, but we'll, we'll get to it. Continue we'll to, to work, and I appreciate you, you. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you, man. All Take right, care. Peace. Peace.